Are you a scaling SaaS founder? Ready to make the leap from leading a team to leading an organization? Join us each week as we refill your think tank with actionable tips and strategies from great business minds and those you don't know yet. This is SaaS Fuel with your host, five-time entrepreneur, SaaS founder, and globetrotting adventurer, Jeff Maines. Welcome back to the SaaS Fuel podcast, where we embrace courageous marketing like surfing massive waves, catching the eye, riding trends, and making big splashes in the market. I'm your host, Jeff Maines. I hope B2B SaaS founders like you grow from traction to scale. Here, growth is more than just numbers. It's about crafting a future-proof company, premium valuation, and leaders who build a business of significance while living epic, adventurous lives. Did you know that AI-powered SaaS marketing is revolutionizing the way SaaS businesses grow in 2024? AI-powered marketing is no longer a distant dream. It's the new reality that is catapulting businesses to unimaginable heights. You ready to join the revolution? Have you done it already? Step into the world of AI and SaaS marketing where data is the currency and personalization is a key to unlocking explosive growth. In this evolving landscape, businesses that harness the power of AI are leaving their competitors in the dust. And I love that. But here's the harsh truth. Traditional marketing tactics are falling short in the face of this upheaval. In traditional, I even mean like normal digital stuff, the way that we did ads just a couple of years ago. With an avalanche of data and ever-shifting customer expectations, relying on outdated strategies is like trying to navigate a spaceship with a paper map. But the challenge ahead of us is pretty clear. How can we cut through the noise, deliver laser-targeted messaging to our ICP where they are, and optimize those campaigns for maximum impact? Now, it's a big task, but AI is here to help make it a lot easier. Imagine having a hyper-intelligent ally working tirelessly to unravel the mysteries of your target audience. Anybody else find that you know, somewhat of a challenge? There's a lot of mysteries in there. There's a lot of depth to our audiences. It's not as simple as it was 50, 100 years ago, and certainly not even two or three years ago. But AI algorithms are the secret weapon for this. Analyzing oceans of data to identify hidden patterns, predict customer behavior, and craft personalized experiences that resonate on a deep emotional level. And I picked that word very intentionally. It's experiences. It's not just messages. How do we bring our audience along with us on that journey and help them experience? At a very practical level, how can you leverage AI and SaaS marketing to drive viral success for your business? From dynamic content adaptation to predictive lead scoring, AI is reshaping everything. It's the foundation of SaaS marketing today. And here's what I see working in today's environment. The best companies, number one, will harness the power of data. Like I said, AI algorithms can analyze just massive amounts of information, identify patterns, predict behavior, and deliver hyper-targeted content that resonates with your audience. The second is they personalize the customer journey. And I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. SaaS marketing tools enable you to create customized experiences for each individual, from dynamic ad targeting to tailored email campaigns, ensuring that your message hits the mark every single time. That's really cool when you can personalize it to that detail and, and create that experience for them. And the third is they optimize for success. They continuously gather data and leverage AI insights. So the model feeds itself. And you can fine tune your marketing strategies literally in real time, maximizing conversions, boosting engagement and driving unparalleled growth. And the results speak for themselves. Success stories are, are awe inspiring. Yeah, I work with a SaaS FinTech who was struggling with leads. I hear that all the time, I need more leads. And at the beginning, they, that's absolutely where they were. And they embraced AI driven marketing within a quarter they achieved 150% surge in qualified leads and 60% increase in customer lifetime value. Way more than we projected. And I've since seen similar results in a dozen other companies following the same process and playbook. It's very cool. Another client was looking at it from a personalized experience, like user experience, customer journey, and using AI. And the outcome was 80% boost in conversion rates. Mind-blowing. 
and 40% reduction in customer acquisition costs. So CAC dropped for 30, 40%. And it's just absolutely amazing results. So if you're ready to take your SaaS marketing to the next level and experience the kind of growth that your competitors can only dream of, it's time to join the AI revolution. Dive in, the water is great. And the best news is that this is just the beginning. Our expert guest last week was John Sarver, innovation and technology consultant at SaaS Logic. We talked about usage-based pricing, hybrid billing systems, and pricing to win. And our founder last Tuesday, John Conifay, CEO of Integrate. We talked about building a SaaS at the edge of two worlds, innovative space tech and legacy government bureaucracy. We also talked about founder challenges and his experience at three space unicorns. If you missed either of those episodes, go back and give them a listen. My guest today is John Miller, founder of Scribewise. He is revolutionizing B2B marketing with a bold approach that champions courage over conformity. Got to stand out, right? John guides companies through transformative growth strategies focused on trust-based relationships and courageous marketing. His pioneering vision is captured in his book, Playing It Safe Sucks, a manifesto for courageous marketing. Welcome a guy who is taking marketing from bland to bold, John Miller. Hey, John, welcome to SaaS Fuel. Hey, Jeff, great to be with you. Thanks, man. Tell me a little bit about your background and how did you come to start Scribewise? Sure. I worked in, I'll give you the short version of my resume. Okay. I swear I won't talk for half an hour on this. But I worked in broadcasting for a long time in the news media and then segued into public relations mostly. And then I was a principal at a PR firm here in Philadelphia, where, I, where we're located and wanted to go out on my own. I had two business ideas back in 2010. One of them was a journalistic entity that covered Philadelphia sports. And I like to say that was an artistic success, but a business failure. And then the other idea was what became Scribewise, which was the content marketing was very nascent at that point. In fact, in 2010, I hadn't even heard the term 2010, but we sure. launched in 2012 with the idea that companies suddenly would need a ton of thought leadership oriented content. I like to think of it as journalistic content, and they would never be able to figure out how to create it all of it. So I used to say that we were an outsourced news, newsroom. Over time, I think a lot of companies did figure out a way to at least do it pretty well. And we've evolved as time has gone by based upon the fact that our team has a basic skill set of being storytellers. And that parlays itself into a lot of different things, um, telling stories that um, resonate with audiences. So let us actually distribute your content to the audiences, telling stories that are the, the backbone of your brand. So let us do branding. So we become a content oriented full service agency, I would say over the last decade. That's great. I, I think you said a lot of businesses have figured this out, but I don't know that a lot of them have, especially the story aspect. They can put out content, but there a lot of times I, I think what's missing is the story that kind of draws the reader in and you know really makes them part of that journey. Yeah, I think it's really easy to create content. It's yes. really hard to create really good content. And That's especially great. the advent of AI, there's so much mediocrity out there and flat out stuff that wishes it was mediocre. Um, so how do you break through? And I would always argue there's a distribution factor and how much money are you putting behind these things to get it in front of the right people. But the crux of that is how do you find that emotional thread that makes right. a story resonate? How do you tell that story in a way that makes people's brains spark? That's hard to do. As a, how have you transformed over the, the last 10 years? Content marketing has really changed a lot. How, what have you done to keep up with that and keep your clients ahead of the game? I think we've been beating the same drum for a long time, which is that we're, we're not very SEO focused. I like to say that we're SEO cynical. And this is, does not completely apply to SaaS companies. It depends on how, what's your, are you selling, can an individual at a company buy a seat for $4.99 a month, or is it a much bigger? And is that how you go to market or are you selling to 
a buying committee that is a much bigger, longer term process. Completely in, different in, animals. In the first case, SEO matters. In the second case, I would argue it really doesn't. Um, but we've always had that approach for the most part that you need to create content for those hundred raving fans, call them, or thousand raving fans, not for the entire universe. So you need to have content needs to be extremely well written. It needs to strike an emotional chord because that's what creates the connection. Even though it's B2B, emotion drives all these decisions. We know that, whether it's fear, greed, whatever, uncertainty. So how are you doing those things? And I would say you need to go deeper, get a lot more detailed, but not meaningless, excruciating detail. So like, how do you ride that line? It takes a human being and a really good writer, I think, to create yeah. that kind Yeah, without a doubt. One of your case studies was about the story stream. How does story play into content marketing and, and how do you use that to engage readers emotionally? Yeah, story streams are, and other companies have done similar things and there's platforms you can use to do them. But basically it's a, it's a I think it's a very energetic way to tell a story. And, it, and I would, for people who aren't familiar, I've seen the term scrolly telling, which I like and other people tell me is way too mm. funny. But it's a long, interactive, quasi-animated infographic. And it's a web page. Um, and to me, it just, it, there are fewer words and something like that, more design, and it just is more energetic. And it to me, it sparks people's brains. And a lot of content that we create, there, obviously you need middle and bottom of the funnel content, case sure. studies, et cetera. But you have to get people's attention and not just get their attention, but get their trust. And trust to me always begins, whether it's a human relationship, business relationship, begins with trying to create an emotional connection. And the person who wants to create that connection most needs to put themselves out there first. Yeah, that makes sense. If you're dating, <laughs> whether you're you know, dating and selling are very similar things. Uh, <laughs> True. Just about how great you are. It's like, why, how vulnerable are you? You need to take some chances. So I think a story stream is, it's a bigger commitment. It's not as easy as writing a blog post, but it should be a lot more impactful. It will be a lot more impactful. Done. I like that. When I think about content, I think about kind of two buckets. One is demand generation. The other is thought leadership. And both of those are, are really key pillars, and, and we need both in most businesses. And so how do we create those together, and how do those things come together to work hand in hand to help SaaS companies grow? Yeah, I think there's a continuum there, right? I would say thought – I would actually – it depends on how we define demand gen, right? A lot of times, to me, demand gen is more brand building, and I would say and mm, lead okay. gen is more, much more focused on – the immediacy of ROI or ROI immediacy, whatever the right way to say that is. Um, <clears throat> but I think you do need all of those things. Um, it starts to me with thought leadership, which is often the exercise, creating thought leadership content is the exercise of pulling the great ideas out of the smart subject matter experts at a given company, which is not, and that's much more, audience focused problem focused as you get more into lead gen it gets more excuse me it's not it doesn't there's not a bright line between audience focused and product focused there's a middle there that's a little bit gray and depends on every inst different situation i think but but i think that it's a continuum and you need all aspects of it and it's hard for one person or one agency or one company to be good at all of those things they are they do sure. have different tones and tenors and levels of detail. And like we, we did a survey recently of B2B marketers and buyers. And I should know these stats off the top of my head, but I don't know the numbers, but <laughs> I'll get them to you. You can put them in the show notes. B2B marketers, like over 90% B2B marketers said that they use industry jargon in the content that they create. But 
I think it was 60 some percent of B2B buyers say they prefer, it might've been 50%, but they prefer plain spoken, jargon free language in the content. Interesting. So they're begging you to make it simple. And marketers, we tend to, two things happen, I think. We tend to want to sound smart. So we use complex verbiage or acronyms that people may or may not understand. And we get lost. We can't see the forest for the trees, right? Because we're too close. We're in the room all the time and we have the curse of knowledge. And so we talk to ourselves. You see it in every business. We do. Right? Oh, yeah. Buyers want you to talk about things in a very plain spoken way. There's a time, as you get more down the funnel and more into the lead generation piece of it, you need to get more, you don't need, I hate to say you need to get more jargony, but you have a, you have an opportunity to get more into the weeds and get into more jargon and really talk about the nuts and bolts of your solution ultimately. And that makes a lot of sense is to make it much more plain, more top of funnel is that the last thing you want to do is to alienate your prospect by making them feel dumb using terms that they don't understand because they can't relate to that. But well, if they, they look at something, they look at content, they consume it and go, wow, I learned something, thought leadership. I, I learned something new. Maybe explain it in an acronym before you, you use it. You're bringing them into the world instead of here's this thing that will make you smarter or better because we know more. Right. Yeah, I think. But the, 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 I do think there's also you have to really understand your audience, which everybody says. We say it all the time. It's really sure. hard to do. It's, it's very hard, it's, yes. Because it's not a static thing either, right? They're changing every day, literally. They yes. learn new things, etc. I do think that there's there's sometimes there's a leap ahead to talking to the insiders as an insider. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Um, like we were talking a little bit about sports right before we came on, and, and I mentioned that I did sports. Like, not every article about NFL free agency states every little single thing about, they assume a certain level of knowledge. Sure. Uh, and that I think makes that's sense. A, kind of a very B2C example of that. But if you're too simplistic, you alienate your audience. That's true. We had a client once upon a time that's an IT consulting firm, and they had, they were very proud of, they used an, like a FAQ that was an accordion thing on a web page. And had very basic questions, which were great for SEO. However, their buyer was a high-level decision maker who would be, I would think, offended that you thought that those would be their frequently asked questions. Hmm. If you see what I'm saying, right? Of course, those little, those, I know all of those, I have answered all of those questions in my head as your buyer. Why are you wasting my time with this? Do you think I'm a moron? So, yeah, so it, it takes both. And, and that makes sense. You said the number was 50% that want something that's in plain language. That means the other half wants something that, that does have jargon that is more advanced. And so it's having that blend of content for your, it's knowing your audience, essentially, right. which right. 50% are they in? Right. And it's not, it's as an agency, we always want to talk to our clients that's hard to do, right? There's a fear there, especially when you just start a relationship. That's the most important time for us to do it. They don't really know us yet. Do they trust us? So it's hard. Like, which clients do we talk to? Are we going to screw things up? Um, and I always say we're not. We're, 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 we understand that we're not, we're not 60 minutes coming to your door, <laughs> coming to the client's door and asking them tough questions. We're on the same side here. But it's also important to do that as time goes by. Because again, those audiences evolve and you need to see where they're at and their situations change, the macro economy changes, whatever happens, some new AI springs onto the scene, my whole business model changes, whatever. So you need to be talking to, if you're an agency, your clients as frequently as you can. And if you're in-house, if you need to sit in on sales calls or whatever it might be, I think that's really important. 
That makes sense. It's staying as close to the client as possible. So you're getting information firsthand, not filtered through something else. Right. Yeah. You, you made a distinction earlier about the difference between lead gen and demand gen. Tell us a little bit about what the differences are and which one of those goes first and why. I would say demand gen comes first. And here, so here's how I divide it. We define demand gen, which is basically generating awareness that a problem exists. Lead gen is when you segue into, oh, we can solve that problem and creating awareness of that. So demand gen, you're basically, it's very thought leadership oriented to me. It's, there's a big chunk of it that is brand building and, and creating general awareness of whatever the issue in the world that you're solving or your thoughts on that issue or and trying to get people to think about that challenge in a different way or a new way, all the while knowing that your solution helps to solve that challenge in a new and different way. And then the lead gen piece of it becomes probably a little bit more paid promotion advertising focused because you're talking, then you start to talk more about yourself your company, your product. And demand gen softens the ground for the lead gen. You can spend a fortune just inundating people with messages. We see sure. it with insurance commercials on TV, a very commoditized product, and they don't talk about their product. They just make us laugh. But we have awareness of those big companies. <laughs> yeah. But they've spent, they, those companies spend it literally billions of dollars a year on advertising. Sure. Um, in most B2B instances and, and SaaS instances, you probably don't have that big of a budget, guessing. So a much more economic approach is public relations, thought leadership, demand gen, creating awareness of uh, the challenge and demonstrating an understanding of the challenge that your customers and prospects are facing. Um, it's just a way more economical way. And once you get it up and running, it becomes an ever accelerating flywheel because people are aware and people come to believe and they create that emotional connection and they talk to each other. And there's a tipping point in there somewhere that if you do it in a sustainable way, I think most companies will hit. Really easy to say, really hard to do, really hard to stay committed to. Yes, yeah, without a doubt. One of the things you said earlier as well about SEO, maybe a little bit controversial, certainly different than everybody out there trying to sell services. You talked about being SEO cynical. Yeah, does yeah. SEO, is that the right thing? And we've talked before about the SEO delusion. Tell me about that. What's your take on SEO? In a nutshell, and we have a piece on our website, if you go to our website, called the SEO delusion, which is a story stream. Um, <clears throat> so our, my basic premise is, and we do a lot with service businesses, which is not really applicable here, but most services businesses, and certainly some SaaS, we have some clients, some SaaS clients that they have 50 customers or a service business will have 20 clients. They don't need a hundred more. They couldn't handle 100. A SaaS company could probably handle 100 more. But still, you want the next 10 or the next 20, whatever it might be. Sure. So let's, sure. I think an ABM approach makes a lot more sense. And SEO is very much an appeal to the masses. Like if you, I always say if you're selling socks, SEO makes a ton of sense. I do think if you're selling individual seats as a SaaS platform, SEO does make sense. But if you're selling a big ticket item, an intricate B2B platform that is a six or seven or more figure purchase on an annual basis, that's a big decision for a company. They're not going to land on your website and make that decision, right? right. Now, you have to get their initial attention somehow, but you're just as likely to get it as a trade show. Now, you do have to do the, the technical SEO correct. It doesn't, this is not about shooting yourself in the foot and just ignoring keywords completely and having your page structure incorrect and those types of things. You have to do <clears throat> all of those things, but SEO is over-prescribed for sure. I think in just about every industry, 
Um, <clears throat> the survey I mentioned that we did, B2B buyers absolutely include a, a online search as they begin to do their homework, but they also anecdotally take it with a bit of a grain of salt. They know it's they know that the the <clears throat> answers Google and Bing and whoever are serving up are the basics. I think to a large extent we're saying, okay, I'm I've heard of these, I have this problem I'm trying to solve. I heard of these companies I think solve it. Let me do some searches to see if there's any other companies I should explore. But they're not immediately make that purchase decision. You have to earn their trust. I, I would argue that in a six, seven, eight figure purchase, you can't earn their trust in a month. It takes yeah. a year, three years. They're only in market every three to five years, probably. At least 95% of the companies that we want to sell to, this goes for any company, is actively looking. 95% uh, is not actively looking at any given time. Right. Percentage. Are we going to, we shouldn't treat the 95% as if they're about to buy because that's annoying, right? <laughs> it is. Yes. We have to have content and marketing materials and sales folks focused on that 5%, but let's focus on the 95% so that when they turn to the, they transform into that 5%, we're much further down the line with them. If you could use some innovation and encouragement like that from fellow B2B SaaS founders on your journey, check out Champion Leadership Group. It is the ultimate resource for SaaS founders and C-suite executives to continue to develop themselves, scale their companies, and never walk alone on the journey. We're kicking off a new accelerator cohort this month, and if you're ready to scale up, this is for you. It's time to elevate from success to significance. No fluff just the right strategies you need at the right time. We focus on capital efficient growth, profitability that lasts, and achieving the kind of valuation that's not just impressive, but impactful. You'll gain access to a network of peers, custom growth roadmap, and an operating system to take your business from traction to scale while freeing you to focus on what really matters. If you're ready to crank it up to 11, visit championleadership.com. That's where leaders evolve and companies transform. It makes so much sense to do that because you're really building trust all that time. And you're right, 95% of the market out there is not ready to buy today. But most of the content that I see is really focused on those that are in market, yeah, the now buyers, and not really building that trust over time. We found that when you, you don't build that trust over time and you try to do it too quickly, you get to the end and, and deals stall or they slow or, or it's much more difficult because you haven't built that trust over time and you haven't you know warmed the audience it's just right. they're, they're coming in cold and you're like okay let's do this and they're like we don't know if we want to get married or not yet because you know right. we haven't dated we are rushing to the altar all the time I, so how do I, we do that where we don't annoy them and don't drag them along how do we more adapt our selling process to match their buying process and build that trust I think, I think it's really hard and I think it's marketing as a universe. I think it's our fault because with the advent of the internet, we could suddenly keep score for marketing. We could never keep score before, right? Really. It was like the famous line from John Wanamaker was, I know that half my advertising works. I just don't know which half. And in the internet, everybody's, we now know which half works. And we got all excited about it and we right. became obsessed with MQLs and SQLs and first calls and all of those things. And as marketers, I'm speaking in a very genericized way, we, in order to get the budget we wanted, promised the CEO and the CFO, who are extremely number, numbers revenue oriented, as they should be. We will, if we do this, it will result in this many leads and this much revenue. And then we, two months into the 12 month budget, realized that we promised 100 MQLs for the year. So we have to have 25 here in the first quarter and we've only got eight. And even that's a little squishy. 
And so let's just start, start calling everybody an MQL and handing them off to sales. And then sales gets ticked off because they're not qualified. That's the key word in that <laughs> acronym. Yeah. And sales gets ticked off and they start, and we've created this, this bad situation and we need to hold the, our ground in a time when everybody's, we need revenue. Like it's a very hard situation. And I don't necessarily know the situation. I think it takes getting to the, the book I wrote about courageous marketing. It takes a ton of courage and in yourself and in your team and in your approach. And again, it's, that's another one of, the, one of those things that's very easy for me to say and very hard for everybody to do. Sure. Let's talk about the book. Playing it safe sucks. The need for marketers to be more courageous at work. How'd you come up with the idea? I think the title is fantastic. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. It was actually, it was, geez, almost two years ago now. Everybody was talking, they're still talking about this. Maybe not quite as much, but now I think we might be talking about it again as we sit here today. We were talking about going into recession and what's going to be, and we were, we had an internal discussion about what is going to be our message. People, and as mar marketers always say, you can't turn off marketing in a recession. And yet, that's what companies do first. <laughs> and we saw that through the course of yep. 2023, right? A lot of people sure did all the payoffs in the SaaS world, especially. So not everybody heard my message. <laughs> but but the idea was, and honestly, I owe a huge debt to a guy I've never met, but whose book, as I was doing research, I found uh, a guy named Ryan Berman, who has a book called Return on Courage which is not just about marketing, but it is his basic premise is that playing it safe is the most unsafe thing you can do. And his book came out about four or five years ago now. And he has a statistic in there that I gleefully have glommed onto, which is that by the year 2019, more than half of the companies that were in the Fortune 500 in the year 2000 no longer existed. Yeah. So think back to 2000. You're in the Fortune 500. Things are good. You certainly aren't more, and not all of those companies went extinct, right? There's mergers, there's whatever. Sure. But you're riding high. There's no reason to do anything outlandish because times are good. You're too big to fail. You're literally too big to fail. Right. And yet within two decades, more than half of them failed because they played it safe. So you have to never stop pushing forward. And I would argue that marketing's job more than any other department of a company is to be the boldest, to be the leaders, to set that tone because we are driving that external impression of our company and to a certain extent, the internal one too, but we're driving how people think about our company and we have to be at the, right at the, the tip of the spear in terms of not doing things outlandish. Like I say, courage, being courageous does not mean being stupid, right? And there's a, <laughs> That's a good uh, thing. <laughs> That's but an it's, important distinction, though. Right. It's not the old, there's an old saying, just spell my name in public relations, right? I don't care what they write about <laughs> me as long as they spell my name. And yeah. apparently in politics now, that's true. But, but I would say for, if you're in, working inside of a SaaS company in marketing and your job is to be a significant component of the revenue engine of that company, that revenue stems from building trust. And if you're just outlandish and crazy and do wacky things, you might get my attention, but I don't know that I want to do business with you. Yep. If I'm going to spend, I'm going to put my career on the line, I'm going to spend $5 million of the company's money, you better be good, not just fun or not just yeah. entertaining. Which That's a really good analogy. We probably all have, or maybe growing up, had a friend or in college or maybe even now have a, a friend that is, is the, the wild and crazy and fun one and a lot of fun to hang out with on some limited basis, but not somebody you want to necessarily babysit your kids. Right. Yeah, it's, a, it's two different things. One is, is fun and entertaining and the other is trust. And those two things are, are, are you know, really different. 
And for, for making, making a true purchase decision in a business, especially if it's a, a decision that matters where your job may be on the line, you're going to go with trust every time. And you, fun is good. Nothing wrong with that, but you have to have that element of, of trust and competency and, and really put yourself out there as you know, being an expert that they know that they're in good hands if they go with you. you the old line um, that, you know, no one ever got fired for hiring IBM kind of is, right? So if you're not IBM, how do you create that aura of trustworthiness? And I've worked at small firms for 25 years. And whenever we were going head to head with a larger firm for a piece of business, I said, we have to win this by knockout. We have to go over yeah. the, if it's, it comes down to a judge's decision, they're going to make the safe pick. Yep. Um, so how do you prove that? It's not just by getting their attention. It's by going over the top in terms of what you're going to deliver to them, how you understand their problems. I was going to say it's not just buying them Super Bowl tickets, but maybe it is buying them. Maybe that is a piece of the pie sometimes. But it's how is this going to work for me um, as time goes by? How if I make this big decision? How do how does it look a year from now? What's my boss going to say to me? That's what as people selling into a company. That's what we have to think. We have to think about the person we're selling to. What's their personal right. situation? Definitely. Yeah, certainly making sure that, that we, we do come across that way. There have been a lot of changes in marketing. You've been doing this for a long time, a lot of change in technology, a lot of change in marketing and strategies, and, and just the way marketing is done, especially with AI. How do you stay ahead of that curve and, and stay relevant and keep your clients relevant? How do you think about adapting to change? That's a great question, and it's so hard. There's so much information. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so, and it's also, as Jeff, there's plenty of people willing to give their opinion on the right way to do things. Of course. Um, who do I pay attention to? Who's right? Who's, and everybody's right for their individual context, but is their context the same as my context? I think you have to consume a ton of information. I'm reading books. I'm on LinkedIn, probably more than I should be. Um, but I think you have to take in a ton of information and then try to figure out what would work for you. I mean, I saw something recently about, uh, well, I, have a, I have a bit in the book about the scourge of best practices, which to me are mm -hmm. kind of a crutch. Like, yep. what are best practices? Let's do what everybody else has done. And <laughs> Let's now, be mediocre. But we're right. safely mediocre. If you're the number two company in your space and you try to mimic what number one is, you know what you'll be at the end of the day? Number two at best. Yep. So, um, <laughs> and best practices have, they have their place certainly, but they should also always be questioned. Yes. I recently read Walter Isaacson's biography of Elon Musk, obviously a controversial figure, but he asks why as he was building SpaceX, which is an industry that has very stringent regulations, as you would hope that yep. they do. He asked all the time of his production team, who created that? Who created that standard? That doesn't make any sense. We're not doing that. And you get a couple of rockets blow up. He was also in outer space. So yep. he had some billion dollar blow ups, literally. But and it's a really important, important thing to ask that question why? And you know, is, is there a reason? Is that reason still valid today? I mean, maybe it was five years ago, but does it still apply today? Are we still in the same place? Is that, that why still the same or has that changed and now it doesn't make sense anymore? Yeah. And I think if you're – everybody who's giving you advice based upon what they've done is looking backwards. This is the thing I saw yep. recently. And not to discount anyone's success or I'm looking back – I'm basing – Everything I'm doing or saying or talking to clients about is based on my experience at some level, but it's also trying to consume what's happening in the moment and looking out a couple of weeks sometimes. Um, if you're trying to be visionary, you need to be looking ahead, not just backwards. And I would argue, I think, to your specific point that what worked in marketing five years ago no longer works. I mean, that... 
we did this survey, and one of the reasons was it started with, does gated content still work? Do people, will B2B buyers, was a question, this question we asked was, will B2B buyers give up their email for a piece of content? And I'll tell you, we were very surprised that close to 50% said they would willingly do. Unfortunately, we didn't do the survey three years ago, because I think if we did it three years ago, 70% would have said they would willingly do so. So I do think that's changing, and I think the bar is higher, and I think they need to trust the company before they give up their email for a random piece of content. They want to see yeah. if they can find it with somewhere else without giving up their email. And that piece of gated content has been the entire linchpin of inbound marketing. We create an ebook, we gate it, they give us their email, we send them a bunch of emails, they hire us. It doesn't work as well anymore. It just does, it still works. It does still work, but not as well. So what are we going to do next? What is the next iteration of that? As much as technology has changed, marketing has changed, buyer behavior is one of those things that, that has definitely changed over the last 10 years, over the last three or four years for sure. And, and I think will continue to evolve. Are, are you seeing that as well? Yeah, our survey shows that too, that people are, buyers have been in control of the customer journey for close to 15 years now. Yeah. And over the last three or four years, I would argue they are exerting control. And what do you mean by that? What do you mean by exerting control? They are, and, and so it's a little bit different for us too, because we're, scribe-wise, we're selling to marketers. Marketers are extremely hip to this game. So I think marketers are more cynical sure. of all of these tactics than some other buyers. So great. Good job, us. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> marketers so. screw up everything. So yeah, we killed the golden goose. Um, but I think uh, buyers are just a little bit more cynical, a little bit more protective of their yeah. work privacy or whatever you want to call it. Like it, it, I, I get 150 emails a day. Do I want 175? Not especially. Uh, and people are just exerting that control in terms of who they want to hear from. Because a lot of us are saying the same thing. We might mean slightly different things, but it sounds the same, especially, yep. if pay, especially when we're inundated with messages and we're not paying super close attention. And I think that also starts to get, I'm seeing a lot over the last four to six months about micro events. And I know a lot of SaaS companies are doing that, like executive dinners, trying to get 20 people in a room for a salon type of environment. And I think that is a very good tactic for this moment in time or going to trade shows that have 200 people, not 20,000 people. Yeah. More intimacy, more in-depth conversations, better emotional ties because you're having more in-depth conversations. So we're back to the future a little bit on some of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely come full circle. I and mean, we've found that to be the, the case as well. It's the smaller events. And I love the two or 300 person events because you have real conversations and you build relationships. Right. But when it's five, 10, 25,000, it's, there's just no time for relationships. Everybody is rushing to, to do something. Most of the people are there for another reason, not, not talking about solutions. I think those have worked well. And, and yeah, I love the small events that they get together, the happy hours, the dinners. Those are, are great. Right. If you go to a, I don't know if this is true, but it popped into my head. I'm going to say it because that's what I do. Go ahead. If you go to a 20,000 person event, you're probably looking to talk to about 10 people. If you go to a yeah. 200 person event, you're talking to the same 10 people. <laughs> right. <You> just, <laughs> but in probably in greater depth, even if it's you wave them across the happy hour, more human interaction than this mass yeah. Mardi Gras that you go to. Yeah, that's exactly right. The more human connection, uh, I think that's one of the things that has changed in the, the buyer journey is, that, is they want that connection. They want somebody to go with them and, and they, they want to do business with somebody that they know and trust. I don't think that's really changed, but the in the digital world, that human connection face-to-face -face seems to have more value now than it did even five years ago. Yeah, I think uh, marketing in the internet era, digital marketing, 
to a certain extent, dehumanized people. They became MQLs instead of humans. And I do think sadly the, and I get it. We're at, at some level, all of our jobs are numbers based. Sure. But I do think the pandemic created kind of a reckoning about how human are we? <laughs> at the same time, especially social media has gone berserk in almost a dehumanizing way. AI, I recently had a former colleague pass away very suddenly, which was terrible. And I was looking for his obituary. And now there are obituary sites completely written by AI, which could is the most dehumanizing thing. Yeah. I can imagine. Like they so I guess they scrape deck with death records or something. So they and they then they go through LinkedIn or your social media or whatever, and they put together this awful obit that was tone deaf. It was just crushing. Like it was horrible to read. So all of that crap is out there. And I think as marketers, we're, I think generally speaking, at the same time, people have tried to be more human in the way we approach work, et cetera. And I think people crave that. And the people we're all selling to as human beings crave that. And it's, be, 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 um, it, it's important for us to acknowledge that, not just taste numbers, but try to create those human connections, even though we're doing it through screens. Yeah, so important. So in all your time in, in content marketing and, and marketing in general, what are you know, big mistakes that companies make? Uh, we'll close out with that. You know, what are maybe you know, three or four big mistakes that companies make that you've seen, you know, especially in the, the last few years? Um, I think a big one that's happening right now is companies are over-relying on AI to create content. And look, that's if I'm a if I'm a non marketer, non marketing decision maker at a company, CEO, CFO, whomever, and I can pay eighty or a hundred thousand dollars to a content marketer in house or an agency, or I can pay twenty dollars a month to ChatGPT. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, but the, the math is simple. But the, that's the wrong equation. The, the bigger equation is what's the downstream impact. And I think a lot of mistakes companies make are a lot of them boil, boil down to what is our cost right now? What is our cost this quarter? As opposed to what is the value down the road? And the value, the cost right now, we can figure out, but we need the vision to figure out what is the potential value and what is the opportunity cost. Um, This is a, a long time ago, 20 years ago, we had a PR, when I worked at a PR firm, we had a crisis communication situation with a college in a terrible situation. And it would cost, basically in lawyer's fees, it cost, I don't know, a hundred or $200,000 to deal with that issue. And so the legal side of that took precedence over the communication side of it. Because we followed the legal that inhibited the communications and then the following year, applications for new students were way down, and it cost the college $2 million. Wow. So that was a huge lesson for me. And also, when you're talking to lawyers, say, yeah. <laughs> that's a different thing. <laughs> another thing. But, but, but I, think that's where, I think that's where a lot of companies, I think most mistakes boil down to that. It's what's the immediate cost versus what's the long-term value? Yeah, that is a really good one. And Where can one, people find one other thing that I'm sorry, one other thing that people a mistake companies make yes. is fishing at the wrong in the wrong streams, right? They're mm, they're yeah. content's in the wrong spot, they're going to the wrong trade shows, whatever it might be, they're doing those things because they've always done them and they're not going to where their audience is. And I think that's a lot of times that's because muscle memory exists and they're just doing what they've always done. It's so easy to continue to do that. Just do what's familiar, do what's comfortable, do what we're used to. And that's a lot of times when we don't get new results is because we're not trying something new. Right. Just We are playing it safe, just like you say and talk about in your book. Sucks. Playing it safe sucks. <laughs> 
Dillion's, where can we learn more about you and Scribewise online? Sure, Jeff. We'll, we're, we've created a landing page for your audience. So scribewise.com slash sasfuel, and we'll have a couple of different ways to connect with us there. But that's the easiest way, a one-stop shop for you. Outstanding. I'll make sure and link that in the, the show notes. Awesome. John, great conversation, incredible information. And I love the perspective. It's something that's very unique. So I really appreciate you being on Task Fuel. All right. It was great talking to you, Jeff. Thanks so much, man. Thanks again, John, for coming on the show and sharing your insights and resources. You can learn more about John and Scribewise at scribewise.com. And be sure to check him out on social as well. As always, all links, highlights, resources, and full show notes are available at sasfuel.com. And be sure to check us out on YouTube as well. Full episodes, video shorts, training, outtakes, and quite a bit more. Now, working out is more fun with a friend and a great podcast. So share this episode with your fitness buddy and hit those goals together. Everyone who shares this week gets a Courage Capsule. It's a once-a-day digital reminder that injects a dose of bravery into your marketing efforts, encouraging you to execute bold ideas that change the landscape of your industry. Join us Thursday on our SaaS Fuel Expert Series, where my guest is Janie Smith, author of Creating Competitive Advantage and Relevant Selling. She'll be here to help you harness your unique strengths and thrive in competitive markets. Anybody have competitors out there? You'll love this episode. And the next Tuesday, we have founder Jason Radisson, CEO of Movo. They are revolutionizing management in the gig economy and international payments. So we'll talk about the secret to skyrocketing employee engagement and operational efficiency through AI and mobile technology. And he's been a part of several unicorns as well. I will see you next time. And as always, enjoy the journey. Thanks for listening to SAS Fuel. Full show notes for each episode, which includes a summary, key takeaways, quotes, and any resources mentioned, are available at sasfuel.com. Be sure to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying the content and getting value from these episodes, please leave us a rating and review at ratethispodcast.com slash sasfuel. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes.